There not a free lab? No. Wait, yes, there should have been. Was there not? Yeah, yeah there's chapter the chapter uh, 13 should have been due today. Not chapter 13, lab 13. That's what I'm trying to say. Lab is at 11 30. Should we do 11 30? Is what it should be. Is it not like on? Uh, Top hat or on canvas? What was I doing? I don't even know. All right, what chapter is this? This is chapter 19. Okay. Okay, so um, now that we are starting out with our uh, presentation, basically every day in lecture, what will happen is whoever is slated to give their presentation that day will be... Um, We'll start off with, with them first, and we'll go in alphabetical order um, unless they have you, know, you, whoever it is, has talked to me previously about, um, you know, not for whatever reason, not giving a presentation for that day, but for a different day, maybe you have something going on or whatever. But so um, we have, I can't really accommodate more than four in a day. And even that, it can be a stretch depending on how long you guys' presentations can be. Um, uh, just to be clear, people have come and asked me before, like, how long does it have to be? To, it does not get you more points to take a long time. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> Nobody's going to thank you for that. So uh, cover the information that you're expected to cover, the stuff, same exact stuff that was on um, the requirements for the slides themselves, right? As long as you're covering that information, I don't care if it takes you one minute to give the presentation, okay? Um, if things that are gonna get you points off, and maybe for the people who are going today, hopefully this isn't like too much of a shock to you guys. If you are straight up reading words off of the slide and not talking about it at all, reading the words off the slide or off of a note card directly and not actually like talking about it, like uh, you knew something about it ever, uh, then you will probably get very few points. So that's the thing that's gonna get you points off for this. Not, if you come up here and you mispronounce a word, I don't care. Right. So you guys just assume I know how to pronounce the words when I say them. That's probably being generous sometimes. Um, as long the whole thing is right. If you can recognize it on the test, that's what I really care about. But so if you guys try to say the words that are difficult to say, 
um, then I am going to be very forgiving. If you come up here and you're like, oh, I don't know how to say this word, so I'm just not going to say it, then I'm probably going to dock you a point for that. At least try, guys, right? So if you're giving a talk about, you know, orthomixoviridae and um, that's what your talk is about, then if you just skip that word, I'm probably going to be like, yeah, I don't get to skip it in my talk. What makes you think you get to skip it? So since you guys are the ones giving the talks over these subjects. Um, now, so for example, the first person that we have going today is going to be Kylie, and she's going to be talking to us about smallpox. Um, so that means I will not be talking about smallpox in any of the lectures. So uh, that's how this is going to go, and that's why you guys are kind of held to that standard. That's why I get picky over the slides. Um, but while you guys are up here talking, as long as you're covering that information, you should be fine. Honestly, like you should get full points if you did your work. So, yeah. Um, so I pulled up everybody's talks. Um, First up, I believe it, yeah, I just said it, it's gonna be Kylie. And so we'll go through this. Um, some of you guys have your, you submitted it on PowerPoint, which this one is on PowerPoint. Um, sometimes they'll come up a little bit blurry up here. Don't worry about it, that's not gonna count a point against you or anything, but if you are on a PowerPoint, oh, there it goes, it goes clear now. Uh, if you're on PDF, which is what these are, excuse me, um, then just be aware you can scroll through these just fine, but they're not going to have any effects if they were on PDF. Um, they'll just be images. But if you submit it on PowerPoint, you'll still be able to click through it and all that um, if you had any effects. So, Kylie. Okay, that's you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I haven't learned anybody's names. I would recognize your faces on the street, but I would not uh, yeah, know your names if my life depended on. So, I apologize for this. That, um, but today might be the day that changes this, or is the presentation day. So if you want to go ahead and come up here, we'll get you started. Um, it'll be Kylie, then Marissa, then Narissa with the N, and then um, Hannah. And so we'll have smallpox, screwworm, which I'm not going to lie, I'm pretty excited about the screwworm presentation. Um, these are all actually pretty, pretty good ones. Necrotizing fasciitis, and then rubella, which you guys might be surprised to hear how interesting rubella is. Let me do up here, you can mouse, um, use the scroll, check the filters. Have fun. <laughs> okay, so I have small fogs, like she said. Um, well, you don't have small fogs. Well, no, I'm doing <laughs> small fogs. Okay, so small fogs is a contagious disease that is caused by a virus, variola. Um, it can be very dangerous. Um, can affect the respiratory and circulatory system, and it leaves scars on your skin. There is a vaccine, although not many, if any, take it now. But before that, the smallpox was a deadly disease. Like I think it's one in three people infected uh, died. I feel like it's really underrated. On I just have to bring this up, but like. We talk about smallpox now. It's like, yeah, okay, smallpox, because we don't think about it now because it's yeah. not, we don't have it anymore. But it was really bad. Like, it was really bad. Yeah, I was going through like researching. I was like, oh my gosh. Smallpox falls under um, orthopo orthopox viral and pox virus. The lesions from orthopox viral leave gram positive rods in the Pox virus um, looks like a brick, basically. And um, pox virus has double strand DNA, which allows them to um, encode all the proteins in the host cell. Uh, and that happens in the cytoplasm. So, risk factors um, uh, smallpox can be spread by air droplets, like coughing, sneezing on somebody. Or even through, like, if I if I had smallpox and I was laying in bed and somebody got in my bed, they would get it more than likely. Um, or if I you have skin sores and somebody comes up and is touching your skin sores for whatever reason that would be, then they can get it. Pregnant women are more susceptible to getting it. Um, but today, smallpox doesn't exist pretty much. So there's really no way you could get it um, unless you're just that rare person that is prone to diseases. Uh, symptoms. So the symptoms for smallpox is like the flu, fever, headache, vomiting, muscle aches, 
and a skin rash. Um, you can get symptoms between 12 to 14 hours after coming into contact with somebody. Okay, so there are a couple um, diseases that appear like smallpox or Rocky Mountain spotted fever, syphilis, and chickenpox, which they all share the same symptoms. So that's how they can be uh, mixed up. Okay, so diagnosing. Testing for this is done in a specialized laboratory. They can do a PCR test to identify the DNA of pox virus, I think it is, or variola virus, or an isolation test to, te to isolate the virus from the blood to um, see if the patient has antibodies working against um, the virus. Treatment, so before a vaccine, or I guess even if you had the vaccine, um, treatments were done just to stop the growth or help with the symptoms, like baking soda, calamine lotion, which just helps with the itching from the rashes it leaves, and um, the pain, so you're not like, itching and then itching somewhere and spreading it. And then optimal bandaging, which is just a gauze with the lining, which just helps like after you clean it and you wrap it to help the, the spread of it. And then, I can't say those words. Yeah, that one. <laughs> Medication <laughs> which is just a medicine you take by the mouth, which is to stop the spread. Um, so to prevent it, there's now a vaccine, but like I said, many people don't really get the vaccine for this because it's not the risk of getting smallpox is rare. But the vaccine is vaccine of virus. Um but if you don't get a vaccine and then you're around somebody with smallpox, you should wear safety um, equipment like mask or just full body suit, honestly. So you don't get it. I think that was it. Yep. Good job. Good job on first. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Marissa, China, sorry, I can't see how it says. All right, if you want to head on up here, you can uh, click with the mouse clicker or scroll with the scroll or use the arrow keys. Yeah, thank you. Someone told me before, either microbiology is either going to really interest you or really disgust you. And after this presentation, I was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be talking about screw worm. Sorry, you're fine. Screw worms are fly larvae that thrive in moist open wounds where they feed off the living flesh of the host. These pests can affect any warm blooded animal, including humans, and this parasite kills livestock and wildlife, but more particularly cattle. Untreated screwworm cases can be fatal due to the invasion of the host's vital organs and can cause blood poisoning and secondary infections. Animals may die from secondary infections or toxicity in seven to 14 days if not treated. Symptoms and signs. Um, in the first couple of days, the infestations are hard to detect. Usually, all that can be seen is slight movement in the wound. Um, infested wounds range from the size of thorn scratches to insect bite marks to gaping lacerations. These parasites can enter the human body through a wound as small as a tick bite. Take another picture of one of the wounds. Mode of transmission. It was, this parasite was introduced to the U.S. by a shipment of infested animals brought over from another region. Infestations are transmitted when a female fly lays eggs on a wound or mucous membrane. The larvae hatch and bury into the flesh where they feed on living tissues and fluids.
Screwworm infestation occurs when a female fly lays her eggs on a, on a wound of a warm-blooded animal. Unlike maggots that feed on dead flesh, screwworms feed off of living flesh. A female can lay up to 400 eggs at a time and almost 3,000 eggs during a lifespan of 10 to 30 days. Eggs hatch into larvae and then bury into the wound for flesh to eat. Roughly after five to seven days of feeding, larvae drop to the ground, burrow into the soil, and then develop into a pupa. The adult screwworm fly emerges and mates after three to five days. Diagnosis is done in the laboratory and the parasites can be identified by looking through a microscope. Other techniques used include cuticular hydrocarbon analysis, analysis of mitochondrial DNA, and random amplified polymorphic DNA polymerase chain reaction. Some wounds may be surgically removed, but most are treated with larvicide and may heal without closure. Treatment is usually done in intervals until the wound is healed. Removal of necrotic tissue may be needed, and antibiotics are typically given when secondary bacterial contamination is present. That was a little different, of course, just because we're talking about, you know, insects. Obviously, that's not going to be helmets or anything else like we usually learn about, but definitely want to learn about these types of things, especially if you're going into um, vet med. But stuff like that and like bot fly, even though they're insect stuff, yeah. do still kind of fall in the realm of microbiology because we're dealing with worms. Anything pretty much that you might see on, I don't know if you guys have heard of the show, Monsters Inside Me or whatever, but that's what these things <laughs> make me think of. It's, it's gross stuff, man. All right, so. I think it was Nerissa and All right, you ready? <laughs> That's ready as you're gonna be. Okay, you should be able to, sorry, click or scroll or use the arrow. Necrotizing fasciitis. Another really appetizing one. Yeah. Um, it's a very deadly bacterial infection and it spreads very quickly. Um, the term necrotizing, it means the death of tissue. And then fasciitis is inflammation of the fascia. So pretty much your skin is being eaten until death. Yeah. But I feel like this one is like super underrated. If you guys haven't seen, so if you guys haven't seen Cabin Fever, which is an Eli Roth horror movie, I mean, this is disgusting. But um, it's about a flesh-eating bacterial disease that's like in the water um, where these like teenagers are, you know, trying to have like a little camping trip or whatever at a cabin. And of course, you know, it, it's absolutely ridiculous at the time, the entire movie. But um, that's the first time I think of now, neck type of fasciitis, where I used to be like scientific about it. Now all I think about is cabin fever and like how disgusting it was. Of course, there's the girl that gets infected first. They put in like this like old outhouse or something, and then these like wolves come and eat her while she's alive. And like, it's that kind of a movie, guys. It's that kind of a movie. <laughs> but that movie makes me think, like, I think of this and that movie like interchangeably. So, anyways, yeah, it's gross. Yeah. Yeah. You're doing it, sorry. <laughs> it is rare, though. So, you're not going to get it every time you swim. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's caused, believed to be caused mostly by group A streptococcus. It's a gram positive, spherical, non motile, uh, non spore forming bacteria. Um, it's the bacteria that also causes strep throat, toxic shock syndrome, and lung infections. The virulence factors are the presence of M protein fragments that assist with group A streptococcal colonization, invasion by the toxin strep. Streptolysin, S and O, and bacterial distribution by streptokinase. How you get it is typically through any breaks in the skin, cuts, scrapes, burns, bites by bugs, puncture wounds, but there are some cases that got them through blunt force trauma. 
you're more at risk for it if you have diabetes, kidney diseases, cancer, cirrhosis of the liver, or if you use um, intravenous drugs. The symptom, there's a lot of symptoms. <laughs> it can be red, warm, or swollen areas of the skin, and it'll spread very quickly. Severe pain, fever, ulcers, blisters, black spots on the skin, changes in colors of the skin, pus oozing from your infected area, dizziness, fatigue, diarrhea, and nausea, all fun things. Diagnosis can be difficult because many other infections have very similar symptoms, but doctors diagnose necrotizing fasciitis by performing a biopsy, looking at your blood work for infection and muscle damage, or looking at imaging of the infected area like a CT scan, MRI, or ultrasound. Treatment um, needs to be happen pretty quickly. You need antibiotics to stop the infection from spreading. Sometimes the bacteria will kill too much tissue, causing reduced blood flow. This will inhibit the antibiotics from going through the bloodstream properly, so then you'll probably need surgery. And surgery has to be done pretty quickly because the spread is very fast. Sometimes a patient might need multiple surgeries, and in rare cases, they might need a complete blood transfusion. Necrotizing fasciitis is very serious and deadly, and it spreads very rapidly. The only way to diagnose this is to run tests on the patient and they have to come in very quickly. The treatments are antibiotics and surgery and lifelong complications include loss of limb and severe scarring. There is no for sure cure, so we have to try to prevent it. The only way to prevent it is to avoid swimming in pools, hot tubs, and natural bodies of water if you have an open wound or cut, which includes tattoos. And preventative measures include washing hands, making sure your wounds are clean and taken care of, and take care of any fungal infections like athlete's foot. Yeah. All right, we had some pretty, uh, <coughs> Some pretty big guys, I'd say, here with that uh, smallpox and then the screw worm and then this with necrotizing fasciitis. I mean, typically, like most of us would just refer to that as flesh eating bacteria. Yeah. It, and it's pretty serious. We'll mention some stuff about some of those as well. But I do want to say before Hannah gets started, you know, that you're there, um, is don't underestimate the, the seriousness of rubella. And I think that you're probably going to talk about it a little bit, but it's just one of those things that people, like we think measles, mumps, rubella, and you're like, yeah, okay, rubella, whatever that is. But like, there's a reason why we vaccinate it, of what, vaccinate for it. Um, but anyways, yeah, so it's don't, it's not any lesser than the other kind of bigger. bigger oh, so yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you got to get the right stuff out. Yeah. yeah, you can scroll um, through the slides. With okay. Well, uh, rubella virus. That's what I'm doing. The rubella virus is categorized as a member of the <clears throat> Matona variety family and the only member of the genus Rubivirus. Rubella contains a spherical envelope, single-stranded positive sense of RNA. Replication happens to occur in the cytoplasm of the infected cells. A viral capsid protein is a virulence factor for the rubella virus. The capsid can assist in the virus and replication in host cells after entry and escape of the host Cells after entry, wait, backtrack. Mm -hmm. Cells after entry and escape the host immune response. With the capsid protein enveloping the virus, it allows the virus's entrance to be overlooked. The small size of the virus only allows it to encode a small amount of proteins, which means the capsid is responsible for performing many jobs, structural, non-structural, and functions at the replication sites. The rubella virus mode of transmission is through the respiratory tract between individuals. It can be spread through direct or droplet contact from nasal or throat secretions from infected individuals. Pregnant women who are infected with the virus are also at risk of passing the virus to their developing baby. Okay, the risk factors, pregnant women who are not vaccinated and exposed to the virus could risk passing it to their developing baby, which could cause stillborn and miscarriage. Complications have been very rare due to vaccines being dispersed at a young age. First one is at the age of 12 to 15 months, and the second one is at four to six years old. 
Hemorrhagic manifestations occur in one to 3,000 cases. They're gastrointestinal and cerebral, and they can last from days to months. Encephalitis occurs in one to 6,000 cases, which is inflammation of the brain, and that can be fatal. Okay. Signs and symptoms. There's a red pinkish rash made of small spots, a low grade fever, swollen lymph nodes, cold like symptoms. Adults typically get body aches and pain, and sometimes headache and a mild pink eye. The diagnostic methods are nasopharyngeal, throat swabs, or urine specimens for the viral detection by PCR. Blood drawn for serology testing can determine whether an individual has been or has had a previous or recent infection or if they've had the vaccine before at all. And then for treatments, there are no specific medication for treatments. So the individuals who are infected mainly have mild cases. The healthcare providers mainly recommend those with mild cases to get rest, take not Tylenol for any existing fevers, stay away from other people and pregnant women throughout the duration of the infection. Contagious from anywhere seven days to and seven days before the rash appears. And then additional information. Other known names for rubella are the German measles and three-day measles. They're not the same virus as the measles, but it was first described as a separate disease in German medical literature, the name German measles. Rubella virus is rare in the United States today because the vaccine becoming widely distributed. The vaccine was first licensed in 1969 to 1970, three for the United States, one in Europe. Rubella is still considered to be a problem today in other parts of the world, in Southeast Asia and Africa. And that's that. Before we get started in with um, what I'm going to be going over on chapter 19. I have some some questions, quote unquote, for us to kind of review over to remind us of some information we have learned in previous chapters that are going to apply. So, um, so far, number one, we have what role can lysogenic conversion play in disease pathology? So I remind you guys, lysogenic conversion is whenever you get genes from being infected with your bacteria, getting genes from being infected by a bacterial phage. So that bacterial phage incorporates its um, genome into the bacterial genome um, during lysogenic conversion um, in that um, lysogenic cycle. Uh, that would be a temperate phage that does that, right? And that prophage is that uh, DNA that gets incorporated in there. It carries genes for maybe it could be toxins or it could be antibiotic resistance. Um, there are actually some antibiotic resistance genes associated with transduction, which is when this happens, the, the a virus transmits the new genes. Um, that is uh, what we see with MRSA, actually. That's one of the ways that it gets antibiotic resistance. So that's lysogenic conversion. How might salt be protective for the skin as a first line of defense? A lot of bacteria aren't able to withstand the osmotic pressure created by high salt content. We've already learned that when we create bac uh, bacterial media like staphylococcus media that has high salt concentration that not everything can grow on it. So it can uh, help prevent things from growing that way. What is the cell shape of staphylococcus aureus? Uh, coccus, obviously that's gonna be round, just a reminder there. And what role or roles does the human microbiome play in preventing disease? Well, the term for that is actually going to be microbial antagonism. Um, they not only are going to take up the stadium seats, like we like to talk about, right? Taking up the stadium seats so the bad guys can't sit down, but they also, you know, use up nutrients in the area and might have their own toxins to fight off other invaders. And why, why does one person's microbiome differ from another? Shouldn't they all be the same? Of course, they're not the same. We've all had different exposures throughout um, our lifetimes, um, been exposed to different environments, different uh, biomes. Maybe some of us were born naturally, others were born by a C-section, so that can all affect your, your microbiome. So um, I think we covered everything here. All right, so getting into chapter 19, our um, first line of defense for the skin is of course gonna be the skin itself, how it has several layers. It's pretty thick and we have that keratin coating, that's that waterproofing coating that gives it that sort of a 
protective um, covering. Then we have hair, nails, and sweat and oil glands. All of these can have some sort of play in how it protects um, us from infection. So the stratum corneum, um, this is the outer layer of that skin. We have keratin in there for waterproofing. We also shed skin cells. If we shed the skin cells, we'll shed any of the bacteria associated with them. We have a lot of lipids um, and other things that can be for some um, invaders, make it harder for them to infect. So the entire epidermis is replaced every 25 to 45 days. Pretty impressive. Every month you get new um, skin, at least the outer layer of your skin. Uh, and then the basal layer um, that's going to make up the basal, the base portion of the epidermis. Um, the dermis itself underneath the epidermal layer um, is also another thick layer of tissue with a lot of uh, connective fibers in between that's like basically the extracellular matrix holding everything together. But all this can make it harder for um, microbes to get in and, um, and all of that. Uh, with follicles of the hair, the sweat glands, um, everything going on in those areas, the pores, um, uh, oils that are being made, sweat that's being made, all that has either flushing action or some sort of, sort of catching action or shedding action. All of this stuff helps with preventing um, the microbes from staying. It's maybe not necessarily their initial function, right, but it still helps in it regardless. So um, there's also antimicrobial peptides present in the um, secretions associated with the skin. There's a low pH. Uh, let's switch to break this down. Lysozyme, we remember lysozyme, lysozyme being that um, enzyme that is associated with hydrolyzing peptidoglycan, breaking down peptidoglycan. Um, that enzyme is, is in your sweat, tears, and your saliva. So anytime that we hear any of that stuff coming up now, this chapter in particular, sweat and um, tears are going to be one Saliva will come later on, right, in the GI tract, but um, natural biome of the skin. Uh, we do have a large, open, vast, dry, salty area, so it's not super friendly to a lot of organisms, but for the ones that it is, that are able to survive, they really do pretty well there. Um, it says, although five major taxa are represented in the microbiota of the skin, basically, um, the prominence of this will, will uh, differ based on whatever region you're sampling based on if you're in, talking about inside of like a moist area in a pore versus like out in the open on the dry. But the two babies that you would probably want to be aware of would be Staphylococcus epidermidis, which is one that I talk about pretty often because it is the most common bacteria on your skin. And then another one that's uh, almost just as common, Propyone bacterium acnes. So S Epidermidis and P. acnes are the most common bacteria on uh, your normal biota in your skin. About 4% of the population can carry Staphylococcus aureus, which we already know is a potential pathogen. Just because you are Staph aureus doesn't mean that you are automatically MRSA. That's not the same. So I want to make sure everybody's aware of that. Um, not all Staph is MRSA, right? Um, almost all Staph is resistant to penicillin, though. Over 99% of all strains that exist are resistant to penicillin, but that doesn't make it MRSA, right? That's, you know, methicillin resistant. That's a whole next level. So, um, but yeah, so here's just a little summary of all that. So we're going to start off uh, mentioning a little bit about Staph aureus. Um, we had uh, one of my students talk about uh, MRSA in my or Monday morning class. So well, we kind of already went over this in that class, but you guys get to hear it from me. I guess that's exciting. I don't know. Um, but we already know Staphylococcus, Staphylo being grape-like clusters and then Coccus being round. We know what it looks like because we've literally seen it in the microscope. And you guys even have taken the tests and seen like the clustered groupings of the circles that were from the purple gram positive circles. That was literally Staphylococcus that you guys were looking at. I mean, it's a pretty tame thing to work with as long as you're working with the lab variety of it. Um, it can withstand high salt extremes in pH um, and high temperatures. It even makes acid for crying out loud when we look at mantle salt auger and it turns it yellow. That's staff that is, um, is capable of doing that. So yeah, I mean, it uh, is viable. It says after moths, but that's supposed to say month, months of air drying. <laughs> um, so it's pretty hardy as well. And that's because it's gram positive with that thick um, cell wall. It's sort of able to withstand all of these things. 
it's associated with MRSA, obviously, when you do have resistance associated with it, as well as other soft tissue infections. Um, you guys are probably going to hear most about it um, if, for those of you who are going into hospital care, um, human care, I should say. But um, MRSA, uh, you know, it's all over hospitals and it's hard to control because we have limited antibiotics that can work and the antibiotics that do work against MRSA can be pretty um, serious, have serious side effects for the patients. So it's like, a, you know, a tightrope walk, basically trying to choose uh, between, you know, uh, the selective toxicity versus the therapeutic index and all of that, like we, we had uh, mentioned in unit three. But, um, but yeah, you often see fever, breaks in skin, maybe um, boil-like raised um, areas of the skin where there could be pus involved. When we're talking about pathogenic strains of Staphylococcus aureus, they produce this enzyme called co coagulase. Coagulase coagulates, you know, so we're talking about literally like clumping up plasma, okay? So you can take a plasma sample and maybe a swab from your patient and mix it and let it incubate and then look at it the next day. And if it coagulated, if it solidified, then that was probably staph because they are pretty well known for having this enzyme. They also have this enzyme hyaluronidase. Maybe you guys are looking at hyaluronidase and thinking that sounds an awful lot like hyaluronic acid that everybody's telling you you need to have in your skincare products. It's great for moisturization. It holds quite a lot, like a hundred times its weight in water or something like that. I used to work in a lab that did research on it and I just couldn't be bothered to care. But um, yeah, so uh, hyaluronic acid is part of your extracellular matrix. So it helps hold like all of your tissue together, your cells together, and helps even create some of the structure associated with um, the mononuclear phagocytic system. You know, how our white cells might be getting around and all of that. Um, hyaluronic acid is important for that. It also gives structure to uh, tissue. So same thing as collagen. So we all already kind of have an idea about collagen. And if you start lacking collagen, whenever you get wrinkles or you get cellulite, all of that exists because of, you know, deficiencies in collagen in those areas. Um, so it has similar function to that. You can think of it as being similar to that. But anyways, um, so if it has hyaluronidase, it can break down hyaluronic acid, which is going to help it migrate into deeper tissues, basically. So it can squeeze in um, and get there. We also have um, staphylokinase to digest, so digesting blood clots. That's one of the things that it can do, but it's just another way for it to get into deeper uh, tissues. And all these other things as well, DNAs, um, lipase, and catalase, um, all associated with staph. So a lot of enzymes they can produce that can help them um, infect. So those are virulence factors, right? And this is just describing in picture format the coagulase test and how it might work. To, for diagnostic purposes, because um, it is actually used for diagnosis. That's, that's a, prob a probable thing. Another disease that staph is associated with um, is impetigo, but impetigo is not just relating to staph. It can also be associated with streptococcus pyogenes, which we learned about um, with the necrotizing fasciitis. Um, so these two bacteria can work in tandem, or it could be one, or it could be the other. But impetigo, anytime, it's usually associated with kids. They get that flaky sort of um, irritated skin infection. Um, that's, this is just a more severe picture of it, but it's not uncommon in children. Kids get it all the time. Um, so yeah, that's impetigo, They're usually associated with, they think starting off with strep, and then the staff comes in um, as like, takes the opportunity, sort of opportunistic here, but it takes over after that and becomes more serious problem um, then. So I think both work in tandem. Um, for staff, they're going to have exfoliative toxins, exotoxins A and B, that are usually going to lead to that flakiness, as well as the coagulase. Strep, for this effect, we have, um, so strep is gram positive, it's a cocci, and it's beta hemolytic. So we know it can um, basically break down red blood cells, right? Hemolysis. We've learned about that already. That this is the one beta is the one where we have the actual clearing, not the green, um, not gross without any change. This is clearing, so actually true breakdown of red blood cells. This is the same strep associated with strep throat, scarlet fever, pneumonia, um, puerperal fever, um, necrotizing fasciitis, certain bloodstream infections, and then rheumatic fever. 
as well. Um, strep, y'all, is no joke. You can get strep throat, and that can cause later on if your uh, body is responding, I don't want to say appropriately, but maybe inappropriately, right, um, to that strep that you can get rheumatic fever as a result of strep throat. So when I'm saying like it causes all of these things, they can all be related from having uh, the other infection. So oftentimes you will see if you've ever had kids or maybe even you yourself have had strep throat. Um, I want to tell you that it is not, not always, some people don't know this. You can have strep throat. Maybe you guys do know this. Maybe you don't, you can have strep throat and not get a rash. Some people don't know that, like legitimately don't know that. You're not supposed to have a rash with strep throat. If you do have a rash with strep throat, you don't have just strep throat. You have scarlet fever, honey. That's a whole next level thing. Yes, that is a whole next level thing. Why doesn't your doctor tell you you have scarlet fever? Because he don't care. It's the same treatment, right? So that's the bottom line. But what's happening there is um, the strep bacteria look a lot like your cells. And so if your body is attacking the strep, it can also start having similar to an autoimmune type of reaction to your cells. And then we start seeing inflammation in other areas of the body, which is what causes the rash. So we'll see that especially with the skin. Um, so that is, is pretty indicative of scarlet fever and then can progress to other things. Um, rheumatic fever is whenever we start having that inflammation that's associated with a strep infection attacking your heart. So you'll have inflammation in your heart as your body attacks your heart muscle, but it thinks it's attacking strep because it looks the same. Um, that doesn't necessarily carry forever, but it can carry forever. And um, we also know that if you have strep, you can have that a type three hypersensitivity. Remember that um, uh, post streptococcal, um, there's acute post streptococcal glomerulonephritis, right? <laughs> that um, immune complex issue. That all of this, thanks, Strep. That's great. Thanks for doing that. So, Strep has all of the possibility um, to do all of these things if it isn't controlled properly or depending on how your body reacts to it. I mean, it really can be very person to person or a kid to kid. So if you've had a lot of strep infections as a kid, you're actually more likely to have scarlet fever every time that you get a strep infection because your body's already, you know, reacted that way previously. So um, yes, then when we come back to that neck, necrotizing fasciitis, which we probably have a whole other slide on it specifically, but um, the flesh eating bacterial disease, it, it really does happen so quickly that like if you come into an ER and they suspect that you might have it, they will draw a line where like the inflamed red area is on the tissue and then watch how it progresses as they're trying to treat you. And if it moves past that line within a certain time period, they're just going to assume it's necrotizing fasciitis and start treating it as such. And we're talking, it is like a full on fight against the clock, um, you know, try to maintain and um, contain this infection as quickly as possible. We're debriding. And if you guys don't know what debriding is, we're talk talking about cutting away um, dead infected tissue and removing all of that so that all that's left is healthy tissue so the healthy tissue can hopefully fight back. But if it's already infected, then you debreed and you, then you go back and you debreed again and you go back and you debreed again. We're talking about open wounds that are left open because they don't have time to graft them because if they did try to graft them, they could just be getting the grafts infected. And so they're just cutting back tissue as quickly as possible to try to contain the infection because there's so much dead and dying tissue that the antibiotics like we've mentioned, aren't even being effective in the area anymore. Um, it's very likely if you start having that situation where you start having mass um, excision of tissue that you're going to lose a limb. It's very likely. So even on otherwise healthy people, this is, doesn't seem to be associated. It, of course, is more likely in people who have poor health, but it doesn't seem to be something that you're completely... Um, exempt from if you're a healthy individual either. And there have, um, as I mentioned, been cases of necrotizing fasciitis in people who don't have any associated open wound. It could just be related to having some sort of blunt force trauma and there's no open wound there. And so how does it get started? It's usually from the bacteria that are just natural in your system because you can just harbor strep. I'm sure you've heard of people who are just natural carriers of strep, right? That's normal. That's not anything crazy. I have a student actually in one of my late classes who has um psoriasis as a result of she was a carrier of strep and she had a particularly bad strep infection and she took antibiotics against that strep but since she was a carrier and it was all over her body her body reacted at like uh, in an almost um, autoimmune response and now she has 
um, psoriasis as a result of having been a carrier of strep. And so she like showed me pictures of when she was diagnosed, she had really pretty horrible plaque psoriasis all over. It was very uncomfortable for her, but um, it's pretty interesting how your body can re react to something that is foreign and then reacts to it like foreign and now reacts to its own body like it's foreign when it shouldn't. So strep, um, we know it will uh, it be involved in breaking down the red blood cells. We can also do rapid testing as well as agglutination tests with antibodies and stuff like that. Moving on to cellulitis, cellulitis, basic um, tissue infection, okay? So we're gonna be talking about a red, warm, um, swollen kind of tissue area. There does not even have to be an open wound for this to occur. We see this a lot in diabetics who are just like have poor blood flow and then that leads to their normal biome um, starting the infection and then it's spreading. This is much slower spread than what we typically see with necrotizing fasciitis. Um, although it is usually associated with staph or strep here. We also have staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. This is usually associated with children. I had a nephew that recently had this so bad they had to take him to a specialist that even though they lived in Kansas, they took him to a specialist in Denver um, because it was so serious. But um, this is a systemic form of impetigo and we have basically detachment of the skin layer um, like the epidermal layers from like the dermal layers, sort of like large scale blistering, essentially. Um, they call it bolus lesions. Le I always say legion and I'm not trying to, lesions um, that are quite a lot like just big old wrinkles um, that can, can be filled with fluid, but they do have that wrinkle tissue paper like look to them um, from that, that skin separating. But this is in an adult, an example um, underneath the arm of this person um, having this, it's not uncommon, uh, but it is way more common in children than it is in adults. Um, but this is again caused by staph and widespread um, skin infection. Next we have gas gangrene. This is also known as clostridial myonecrosis. We wanna figure why it's called clostridial myonecrosis? Yeah, because it's gonna be caused by clostridium. So um, this, in this case, Clostridial myonecrosis, myo being muscle tissue, necrosis being death of muscle tissue, right? So um, gas gangrene is caused by clostridium. Perfringens, this is also associated with uh, food poisoning. So something else, poisoning, that's a five, I am aware of it, but pretend like that's an S. Um, it's uh, endospores automatically know that because it's clostridium, right? So that survives in a lot of conditions. You can have clostridium perfringens as part of your natural biome. It's really common actually, especially um, in uh, the urogenital tract, in the, in the vagina. Um, it's found in the soil, it can be found on the skin, it can be found all over the place. People often don't know this. Um, kind of like how C. diff is, which we don't think about it because it's usually in small amounts, that you know, doesn't come up, but <clears throat> until it does, right? So that's how clostridium perfringens is. It's hanging out wherever. Another clostridium that hangs out in the soil that we don't really think of as being there, it's just hanging out as endospores, just waiting for times to be right, would be clostridium tetanus, right? We've already learned about that one. You can step on a nail outside and that lets the endospores get into your wounds. This is kind of like that. We saw a lot more of gas gangrene. I'm sure you guys would typically associate this with like old school wars, like what, like even not even like, I say World War One, but even well before that, right? We're talking about people fighting with like bayonets and stuff like that, um, swords and getting deep flesh wounds and um, the bacteria in the environment, endospores in the environment getting into the wounds. Clostridium, all clostridium species are anaerobic. They don't like the air. So if they get into the deep tissue wounds, they can grow and become pathogenic pretty quickly as long as there's no air around them. So one of the ways that you can actually treat gas gangrene is by putting people in hyperbaric chambers and exposing them to more oxygen so that we can get rid of the clostridial bacteria once they've taken hold. However, okay, so um, you usually see this caused by clostridium perfringens. It can be caused, of course, by our good old friends with skin infections in general, strep and staph. Um, there's two forms of gas gangrene anaerobic cellulitis, where it's just occurring kind of in one area, and then true myonecrosis that can just spread onto other healthy tissue that wasn't previously infected. Um, it's, it's bad. This is like, I feel like even a poor representation of what you would see from gas gangrene. You can see uh, with, with people who have um, 
gas gangrene and have suffered the wound and it's continuing to spread through the true myonecrosis, that their muscle tissue will swell up. And that swelling causes leaking of um, fluids from within the tissue itself. And um, because this is an anaerobic bacteria and they don't need oxygen, a lot of the times with anaerobic, anaerobic bacteria, their byproduct through making ATP, the anaerobic way, the true anaerobic way, um, they have weird gas byproducts. And it could even be things like methane or sulfur-based gases and stuff like that. But uh, whatever it is, uh, Clostridium makes a gas byproduct. That's why it's called gas gangrene. And that gas can actually collect within the tissue itself. And that's what is causing some of that swelling. So as we're collecting gas within the muscle tissue um, and then swelling in the tissue and your skin, your skin, by the way, can only hold so much. So it'll start to rip and tear and you can have um, that happening. So they'll do what, um, gosh, I can never remember what it's called. Maybe you guys will remember what the word is for it. Whenever they like cut the skin. <clears throat> Um, okay, yeah, so yeah, they'll cut that. Yeah, they'll do that in order to, if you guys haven't heard about this, literally cut skin open to let it have space to swell so that it won't rip because it's, it's, you know, preferred to have it actually be cut surgically in a sterile sort of situation as opposed to ripping itself open from the swelling that you would see that being preferable. So that, that's not uncommon if you do see gas gangrene. Now, we don't see a lot of it anymore because we're just not having those deep wounds like going unseen for that long typically but you do see it in, in certain patients so it's just as uh like a cross section of tissue where we can see gas build up this blank space in here this is all gas that's built up from the clostridia uh, bacterium uh making gas as a byproduct from living in the muscle tissue the muscle tissue itself is the pink and then the dark um, rod guys here, those are the clostridium bacteria that are living in the tissue. So that's what we would see. They have these toxins, and I'm not going to test you guys over these toxins, but I feel like it is kind of interesting to think about the enzymes they have. These guys not only have hyaluronidase to help them move and live and create their living environment in tissue, but they have collagenase as well. So these guys can actually break down collagen um, in addition to the hyaluronic acid. So they can create their diseases there. Moving on to the vesicular and pustular rash diseases. We've already talked about smallpox. We'll talk about some of the other ones. Starting off with chickenpox. Chickenpox is caused by a virus. It's a virus. And in case you guys haven't looked on the module for unit four, if you go into the modules, we already have up our study sheet, of course. Um, and then we also have a, an um, Excel spreadsheet, and I meant I always mean to go over it, and I never remember to actually do it. But the Excel spreadsheet, you can actually sort the categories, like based like, alphabetically or whatever it is, if you want to help you guys study, like test your mind of like what you know system it affects or what type of organism causes this or whatever it is, you can sort it based on those things. So um, that's set up with most of the information that you would need to know for those illnesses. Um, again, everything that you would should need to know should be contained within that study sheet, but um, definitely both of those combined a great tool for studying for the, these diseases. I'm sure you've noticed as well that most of this is going to be memorization. It's not very much concept, so that's kind of nice reprieve, but it's also why I'm not doing study sessions over unit four. So that's why we're going back over units one and two, because to give a little bit more, um, I don't know, time on those hoping that you guys can get through unit four fine with typical, you know, uh, flashcard techniques and stuff like that, since I'm not introducing new concepts. Just talking about diseases and stuff you need to know about them. But anyways, chickenpox is caused by a virus. The virus that is associated with chickenpox is called varicella zoster. And I'm sure it's on the slide somewhere on the one of the next few slides, but I'm just going to go right it here because I'm talking about it now. Um, that virus is called varicella zoster. It is a herpes virus, a human herpes virus. So it's a DNA virus and it's gonna incorporate its DNA into your DNA and hide out in your nerves like all herpes viruses like to do. That's not news, right? We know it hides out in our nerves because we know about how shingles when it comes out later on in life um, comes out on the nerve. Right, so that's gonna be along the trunk usually. You'll have it come out along um, the nerve over here somewhere. There has, it's like a, some sort of dorsal something nerve, but I don't know. I didn't take anatomy. That's y'all's job, not mine. So <laughs> you guys can have fun with that one. But 
Um, that's the chicken pox. Um, yes, it is true that like when I was a kid, uh, like I look back on like when I was a six years old. So I think I was six or seven when I got the chicken pox. So it was like 1990 and um, get brought to these actual like literal parties with kids that had chicken pox and you were expected to get the chicken pox. You didn't know that, of course. You're just having a good old time with your friends. And then like, you know, five to seven days later, you get the chicken pox and you're itchy beyond all recognition and you can't think of anything else. But then, you know, your parents are like, now you're protected against the chicken pox, whatever. So that's great. Except for like, by the time that I was out of college and it did take that long, um, but uh, everybody was getting vaccinated for the chicken pox. So um, yeah, I mean, I, it took until I was an adult until that vaccine was actually being used. But um, so I guess I'm protected. I don't know, but I'm also at risk for the virus that I had when I was a kid re-emerging later as shingles, which is what shingles is. You had to have had the chicken pox um, to get shingles. Now, does that mean that if you, um, you guys, those of you who haven't had the chicken pox, I'm assuming, um, those of you who haven't had the chicken pox, if you didn't get vaccinated, would that mean that later on in life, when you are like, I don't know, 50 or something, that you couldn't get shingles? Well, you could absolutely get shingles. Um, it just means that we have to keep you up to date, up to date with your vaccinations, right? To keep that from happening. Why? How could you get shingles if you didn't ever get the virus and it can't reemerge? You can just get it. And when you're older, your immune system works differently. And that's why it would present that way. It's going to be much, much worse um, when you're older compared to when you're a kid. We've already learned about how your T cells, like, like your thymus, it's gone by the time you're an adult, pretty much. Um, so a lot of the strength of your immune system exists when you are a kid. And that's why they want to expose you when you're a kid. So you can get that nice immune response while it's strong, while it's healthy. Otherwise, whenever you're turning 50, um, you know, I don't know. I feel like every, every, every decade of your life, you're always staring down the next decade. So now I'm staring down 50 is coming. And I feel like that's whenever, like, that's when you are old. Yes. That's when they do like, <laughs> that's when they're like, not just now you get colonoscopies. Is it when you're 40? I think it's 45 or something like that colonoscopy so I'm looking at that coming up any day now and all of that stuff so I'm getting the old person stuff heading my way and shingles vaccine is one of them um they don't let, necessarily let you take it early by the way it's like your doctor has to recommend that you get need to get it early for some reason or another but anyways it's my life now guys it happens to all of us I guess um getting older is what they call it but I don't know not it's not happier older not happier so chicken pox, um, and I feel like here's my wisdom, okay, being old. Here's my bit of wisdom that I'm going to share with you guys. When you get older, it truly is. Wiser means you realize that you don't know what is happening ever. That's what wisdom is. And I feel like when you're young, you think you know things and that you're going to learn things. When you get older, the older you get, the more you know that you know nothing and you never will. And you just come to terms with that. <laughs> That's what it is. So um, if nobody's told you that, then I don't know. There it is. You got that pearl of wisdom from me today. It's not meant to be cynical. It's meant to be honest. <laughs> so um, we have uh, usually about four to seven days of illness once you actually have uh, the presence of the lesions developing for chickenpox, and it doesn't usually last. It's not too bad, right? You get some scarring only whenever you get infections from scratching. It shouldn't scar other than that, though. I have quite a few scars, which just means my parents liked to let me, I guess, scratch at it as opposed to deal with, you know, making sure I was comfortable or whatever. Shingles is just going to be whenever you have uh, that same exact herpes virus. It is human herpes virus 3. It's the same thing as um, varicella zoster, but it'll come out along the one of the thoracic nerves there. Um, we already talked about smallpox, and yes, it is caused by variola virus. There's two versions, major and minor, and the one that we always talk about when we talk about smallpox is variola major. It's the one that is the most severe, extremely deadly, underappreciated, been around forever though, right? We've even heard these like horror stories of basically like, um, you know, Spaniards coming along to the Americas and giving um, the natives blankets that were contaminated with smallpox on purpose, right, to kill the native populations or at least weaken them to the point that the Spaniards could come in and then take whatever the resources or the land or whatever it was that they wanted, so they wouldn't actually have to fight them. That's real. Yeah, that's real. That's came from the truth. 
And um, that's biological warfare. And um, now the big concern with smallpox still is biological warfare. We don't have smallpox in the world anymore. Nobody gets it. Um, it's been completely eradicated from the planet. There are stores of smallpox in certain countries hold it in like deep freeze, basically. Um, the United States hasn't vaccinated for smallpox in decades. Um, I have parents that will tell you up and down about how they're vaccinated for smallpox and la la la, and isn't that nice? But the vaccine only lasts about 10 years. So they're not actually vaccinated anymore. Um, they, we vaccinate our military. That's what we have the resources to vaccinate for. Um, so anybody who goes into the military will um, get vaccinated for smallpox. It creates a scar on the arm. It's like this, they call it excoriation, but it's like skin um, level type of uh, scabbing that'll happen from the vaccination. And then that scabbing and the falling off of the scab and then the leaving of the scar is what indicates that it was a successful vaccination. If it doesn't scar, then they consider it unsuccessful. Um, but yeah, they'll still, like if you're, work, if you're a scientist working on monkeypox or something, they will still vaccinate you for smallpox and all that just because you're working with a similar thing. The, uh, if you want to get vaccinated for smallpox, back in the very, very, very first vaccine ever of all time ever, um, there was this man named Edward Jenner who noticed that milkmaids had nice, clean, happy, beautiful skin. Right? Everybody else was getting smallpox and it was not pretty. And so he wanted to know why they had such nice skin. I'm sure you've, well, you guys have even heard probably that saying of like pretty as a milkmaid or something like that. Well, it was because they didn't get smallpox. And so he noticed that. And he noticed that cows had cowpox, which is a very similar disease, and that the milkmaids might get cowpox on their hands, but it didn't leave any nasty scarring or anything. But then they were protected from smallpox. So he went and took some scrapings from cows that had cowpox um, and inoculated his son with that and then exposed his son to smallpox straight up and he was protected. Um, and it's a different virus. The virus that causes cowpox is called vaccinia and um, vaca for cow, right? So that, that's where that word comes from. And that's why we call that it vaccines now is thanks to vaccinia virus um, that we use to vaccinate against smallpox. So it's a very, very first vaccine and it's a horrible story, but it was very effective and it's where the entire concept of all vaccination has ever come from um, since then, and why we still even use that word today. It's a pretty interesting story, I think, um, cowpox being used to vaccinate against one of the worst diseases. And like we said, like one in three people would die from very, um, very low major. So it was a pretty serious thing. Um, so yeah, we eradicated it with vaccination. That's how we got rid of it. Um, we're on the, on the way of doing the same thing with polio. It's not quite been gotten rid of, but we have two countries left that are hanging on, um, Afghanistan and Pakistan, but almost got rid of smallpox, have it in cold storage. Um, the United States only vaccinates the military. Russia vaccinates every single citizen ever, still, today. So that should say something to us as United States citizens, I think. Um, what, how, how uh, you know, Vladimir Putin views this sort of a situation. Um, they have a cold store freezer a sample of it as well. I'm sure you can imagine. All right, moving on. Now that'll give you nice, happy dreams at night. Just to be clear, okay, I like Vladimir Putin. Um, like, not that I think he's listening or something, but I genuinely do, because I think he's a ridiculous person. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but he is, okay? He's ridiculous. He rides his horses with his shirt off and thinking that he's just some hot shit and, like... <laughs> How can you not think that's absolutely absurd? I just, I love it. So um, anyways, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Or like this video, so you guys seen the memes of him with his dog? Like it was like Ukraine or China or somebody got him like a dog and they like pick up the dog by the scruff of its neck and like hand it out like it's some sort of disgusting piece of trash. And he like grabs it and like cuddles it and he's like loving on it. And then there's like years worth of video of him and his dog like going to meetings together and like all this stuff. Him and you guys have to love Vladimir Putin sometimes. I mean, there's just stuff you can't not love about him. So, <laughs> so that's me. Now you guys know my feelings about, about that. Anyways, moving on to hand, foot, and mouth disease. You guys have probably, if you have kids, you I know you've heard of this. So hand, foot, and mouth disease, whenever they get a little rash on their hands or the bumps of their feet, maybe on their uh, on their bottoms um, and, and stuff like that. It can be a little bit uncomfortable, a little sore. No, but it's usually pretty quick to recover on its own. It's caused by a virus. That's Coxsackie virus. It is an enterovirus, just like we learned about with bacteria with being enterics. Entero means in the gut. 
So it's like gut-based uh, viruses, just like polio virus as an enterovirus. Um, you would drink water that was contaminated and then it would go into the gut and then move into the nervous system and do polio stuff. So anyways, maculopapular rash diseases. Now here we're talking about measles, rubella, which we already mentioned, fifth disease and roseola. Measles, very, very, very contagious. And we would need 95% of the human population to be vaccinated to protect the other 5% that couldn't be or wasn't. Um, we've had an increase of measles um, uh, prior to COVID pandemic coming around because of the lack of vaccination that we're seeing. Are we seeing that still now? Yeah, absolutely. We've had several outbreaks, especially in like Florida, and especially in the South. I mean, who's really that surprised? But um, you can also call measles rubiola, which we never call it that, but you know, whatever. It can get pretty serious. It's not only just going to be this this rash. Um, yeah, you'll have cough and some respiratory systems associated with it as well. But um, and even pneumonia can develop. You can have secondary bacterial infections and even progressing into subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. So we're talking about neurological effects as a result of this viral infection that we typically think of as being pretty pretty tame. It just depends on how your body deals with it. Um, we already talked about rubella and how it is the germ and measles. Probably the most important reason um, to be concerned about this, to be aware of it, and to be knowledgeable about it is because it is very well known and well feared for um, causing miscarriage in pregnant women. Now, we don't think about it much because most people usually are vaccinated with the MMR vaccine, but now as there's been a greater increase towards um, anti-vax movement, we're seeing um, more and more issues with this sort of stuff. So miscarriage and permanent defects can be associated with that. Um, if you had postnatal rubella, meaning that you're a child that becomes infected with this, if you didn't get vaccinated and, and you're exposed to this, um, it's gonna be a mild disease, um, might have some redness in, in the cheeks and, and stuff like that. But if you have congenital rubella, so you're a mother, you're pregnant with a child, and that and you become infected with rubella, you probably would have very, very mild symptoms. But your baby could be deaf, have cardiac abnormalities, ocular lesions, rash, mental and physical retardation if they survive it. So it's serious, it's very serious. Fifth disease, also known as uh, slapped cheeks disease. I'm even going over some of these that I just realized that I'm gonna have to wait for. Yeah, Kelsey, sorry, I went over measles and that was your presentation. I know you're coming later. We had six people who were presenting over skin and eye diseases and I couldn't fit all six in one day. So my apologies, but I guess nobody's crying over it probably. <laughs> um, Fifth disease, slapped cheeks disease uh, uh, effect. Uh, really, you've probably seen kids that have, have had this. Um, it just really is like a red cheeks, maybe have a low-grade fever. And that's kind of it. That's all it is. Caused by human um, parvovirus, parvovirus B19. It is not related to parvo in canines. Well, it's the same kind of virus, but it's not the same disease, right? It's completely different. Um, roseola, which nobody ever talks about really. Um, this is uh, going to be one of these diseases that's just super, super minor. You might see a mild rash in about 30% of cases. 70% of cases have no symptoms whatsoever. And 100% of the U.S. population, it has already been infected by this by adulthood. So all of you have already had this. You just didn't know it. It's just one of those, like nobody cares kinds of diseases. But it is a thing that exists and the disease. Warts. Um, Almost there. Getting there, getting there. Warts are, I mean, gross. We can, I think we can all agree with this, but most warts are going to be caused by a virus called human papillomavirus. Maybe you guys think human papillomavirus, HPV, sounds a lot like sexually transmitted virus. And we will come back to that when we're talking about the genital warts and also primarily cervical cancer when we get into that chapter, which will be the very last chapter, I believe. Yes, chapter 24. Um, but you can also just have regular warts, and those are also still caused by HPV. They're just different strains of HPV. So there are warts. I don't know. There's common or seed warts. There's planter warts, and there's flat warts. Um, they can be uncomfortable. Um, they're all just the same kind of deal, though. You also have something called molluscum contagiosum. This can also be associated with sexual transmission, but um, they look like warts, but they're not true warts. They're caused by something else entirely, and um, it's a milky... Uh, discharge that can come from the little wart-like um, 
bumps that you can get. Um, we really only see this mostly in the Pacific Islands. Um, children get on face, arms, legs, trunks, and adults get it in the genital area because it tends to be sexually transmitted um, for adults. And people with immunocompromised um, immune systems can have a very disfiguring widespread um, situation occur from this. It's pretty um, uncommon in the United States. We don't see this. Leishmaniasis is a zoonosis. It's transmitted by uh, biting flies, biting sand flies. The, f the females, just like what we have with mosquitoes, the females. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but the male mosquitoes don't bite you. It's only ever I mean, the females. Um, I don't know, the more you know, I guess. Cutaneous leishmaniasis versus mucocutaneous. Cutaneous, literally just the skin that's going to be seen in uh, Mediterranean, um, Africa, Southeast Asia, and then mucocutaneous, we see this in um, Central and South America. We do also have had cases in Oklahoma and Texas of, uh, of this. It's uncommon, but it has happened as actual true um, spread into the area as we've had global warming, bringing more um, insects and more diseases up from south of here, basically. So uh, pretty serious stuff. Uh, it is bacterial. Um, and it's it's also gross. I don't know what else to say about it. And we have, uh, you can have it also come up like later. Like you think you have gotten over it and treated it, but it can like hide out and then come back out later on in your life. It's gross. Then we have anthrax. Not all anthrax is the same. This is a version of anthrax that is the cutaneous version. You can also like breathe it in or have systemic anthrax, sort of like what we would see with the plague, right? You have bubonic plague, you have systemic plague, you have, um, which is, you know, like the black plague, by the way, or um, pneumonic plague, it's like what you would breathe. So sort of similar to that. Cutaneous anthrax, this black wound here, this is real. This isn't like a fake image. This is really what it looks like when you have anthrax. It's called an eschar, and it's caused, you know, by being exposed to anthrax endospores and then getting into the skin and um, leading to this lesion. Cutaneous anthrax is the least severe form of anthrax. It has a 20% mortality rate, which in case you guys don't know, that's still pretty effing high. That's pretty high. Um, then next is, is uh, ringworm, which I'm actually not going to talk about it because Daniel's going to talk about it in his talk later on. Um, I remembered that. Sorry, Daniel. So now, <laughs> yeah. Um, just to touch on it briefly so you guys have something to go off of, I do want to be very clear that ringworm um, being a cutaneous, first of all, that means skin, right? Muc mycoses, mycosis, mycosis or mycoses, which is plural, um, talking about fungal infections. Okay, so these are all fungi. Even though they're called ringworm, they are not helminth. Okay, they're all fungal. I'm sure most of us know that, but I just want to be clear that we're all on the same page there. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into this, uh, but there's all different areas of the body you can get it. Not a big surprise there. We can get it on your, your general body, your trunk, on your scalp, in your beard, groin, foot. We call that um, athlete's foot when it happens in your foot um, and, your, and in your nails. So basically fungal infections in these areas. There are other kinds of mycoses that are going to be superficial. They're not going to be causing any real um, obvious damage to the tissue, but they can cause visible effects. The most obvious one is going to be tinea versical color. We know tinea sounds like worm. It's meant, it means worm, literally, but it's just like the ringworm. It's not really worms. It's fungus, okay? The mycosis, it's fungal. And uh, the malassezia yeasts that are associated with versicolor um, are going to cause a reaction within the skin that leads to um, color change of the skin. You can actually treat someone who has this um, with certain antifungals and that can restore pigmentation of the skin over time, but sometimes it's permanent. So it just depends on the person and when you're treating it and all that sort of stuff. So that can actually be caused by fungi. The next part of this, which is only gonna be a couple of disease, like three maybe diseases, is going to be the uh, diseases of the eye. So, um, we have, uh, of course, to protect your eye, blinking, duh, right? So in your, your whole conjunctiva, as far as everything covering the outside of your eye to protect it from foreign matter, the cornea as the windshield of the eye, the, co the coating, um, the outer layer of your eye. Um, tears, but probably the best defense for your eyes. You have fluid, oil, and mucus there. The blinking 
to move the tears, um, the flushing action of the tear, tears. The tears can catch um, stuff in them themselves and all that stuff. We also have any eye immune privilege. This is something that's gonna come back on the next chapter when we're talking about the nervous system, but immune privilege is incredibly important, especially in the nervous system, because if you are having an inflammatory reaction in a part of your body that you absolutely need in order to survive, whether that is seeing um, in order to avoid predators or something like that, you know, or to hunt to get your food, it could also be as, as obvious as if you have your central nervous system having an inflammatory reaction, you know, uh, that's going to cause permanent damage. Your body can't recover from that. So you can't have you going paralyzed just because you had an infection in the central nervous system. So immune privilege exists in your eyes and in your central nervous system to protect your body from damaging itself, basically. Um, it's less severe, less serious in the eye compared to the central nervous system. So they still have um, some response there, but, but yeah, so there is immune privilege in the eye to maintain all of that. And you do have normal biota in the eye. Okay. There are bacteria there. All right. First is conjunctivitis. This is an infection of the conjunctiva. It can be bacterial, viral, or allergic. There's three forms of it. Bacterial, viral, allergic. Bacterial is going to have a milky yellowish, potentially a uh, discharge. So thick, um, thick discharge there. Viral, you'll have clear Exudate and then allergic, you'll usually have just a lot of like weepy eye going on, a whole lot of clear fluid. Redness and eyelid swelling are common with any of them. And then photophobia, which doesn't necessarily mean um, that you're afraid of light, it means you have you're sensitive to the light. So it like hurts your eyes. So pink eyes also what they call it. This is a picture of a little baby with conjunctivitis, clearly bacterial conjunctivitis. Okay, the next is ocular trachoma. This is the A at number one most. Um, common infectious cause of blindness worldwide by far. And it is caused by bacteria. This is a bacteria. And that bacteria is called chlamydia trachomatis. Yes, chlamydia trachomatis also happens to be the bacteria that causes chlamydia in a sexually transmitted infection. So it is the same exact bacteria. But in this case, we have an infection on the uh, in the eye and it causes these bumps on the inside of the eyelid here. And those bumps, cause um, like a braid against your cornea and cause blindness that way. So that irritation um, leads to blindness from that. It is treatable, you know, with uh, antibiotics and stuff like that, but it is the number one infectious cause of blindness. Next is keratitis. Um, this can lead to corneal destruction completely. It's pretty like a much more severe version of conjunctivitis, essentially. Um, keratitis, usually caused by HSV-1 or acanthamoeba. These are the ones that you'd be concerned with anyways. HSV-1, we're just literally talking about herpes in the eye, okay? Getting transmitted herpes, typical herpes, into the eye. It could be oral herpes or it could be genital herpes. It doesn't matter. It's the same virus in case you guys didn't know that. Um, but yeah, you don't want it in your eye. It's bad. And then we have acanthamoeba. Um, it says tap water and freshwater lakes. This is one of the amoebas associated with the brain eating amoeba diseases that we will talk about in the next chapter. So it's one of those. Uh, these are usually associated with a cancer amoeba infection, usually associated with contact wearers who you don't like use sterile solutions instead use just tap water. So don't be that person. If you run out of your sterile contact solution, just go buy it. Don't try to, don't try to force literally, you know, your way through the day with tap water. Don't risk it. Last, uh, we have rip, river blindness. This is a parasitic infection that's actually caused by a worm called Onchocercovolvulus. Black flies will transmit the worm into eyes. Like we see a lot of flies landing on little kids in Africa, like we sometimes see in, um, you know, donate money videos and all this. Anyways, they are, can transmit the worm larvae into the eye um, that way and then they will migrate into the actual eye tissue itself and the inside of the eye, the worms will live there. The worms themselves are infected with a bacteria called Wolbachia. So this is a bacteria. And if you guys have ever heard of in um, vets, for those of you who are going into vet stuff or work at vets, um, any self not all vets, but some vets will treat heartworms with doxycycline first, like a, a round of doxycycline. And that's an antibiotic, right? That's not, you know, going to treat the worms themselves. But it treats the Wolbachia bacteria that are present inside of the worms and then makes the worms more susceptible to ivermectin or whatever it is that they're going to give 
the dogs or other animal for their heartworm infection. So that's a pretty interesting little thing. Um, a lot of worms can have that Wolbachia bacteria. It makes them more uh, dangerous infection-wise. So that's it for this chapter. Uh, every chapter ends with a little chart like this, basically showing um, everything that we've talked about. So if you guys are interested in that stuff while you're studying, that's that. So uh, you can take a picture, I guess, of this naked lady and post that. <laughs> And then we'll go over to the lab and get going. Most of them are going to be like this, where we won't really have a whole lot of time to go over the um, cahoots. And I'll try to post the cahoots. Somebody already emailed me about it today, so I'm going to try to get to it after lab, uh, so everybody has access to all the cahoots for study purposes. Thank you. 